Good morning, Revival. Let's go back to September 29th, 2006. That's when Petty Officer Michael Mansour is United States Navy SEAL operating in Ramadi, Iraq. Mansour is standing on a roof in Ramadi, and he's standing in front of a doorway to this roof. He has two Navy SEAL teammates lying in the sniper-prone position next to him at his feet. They've already taken AK-47 fire and a rocket-propelled grenade, but they're not exactly sure where the enemy is. There's a bit of a lull in the fighting. Insurgents have blocked off the streets in Ramadi, and there's someone on the loudspeaker in the town mosque yelling, Kill the Americans! As Mansour and his team are looking for the next attack, an insurgent from an unknown location throws a grenade up on the roof. It hits Mansour in the chest, and it falls to his feet. Due to the length of the throw, there's no opportunity to pick it up and throw it back. He has only a split second to make a decision. He can leap through the doorway behind him and save himself, but if he does, his two teammates lying at his feet will surely die. Mansoor yells, Grenade! But instead of jumping backward to save himself, he jumps forward chest first onto the grenade. It detonates. 30 minutes later, 25-year-old Michael Mansoor is dead. His two teammates lying on the roof receive only minor injuries because Mansoor's body muffled the blast. One of the survivors said at Mansoor's funeral, Mikey looked death in the face that day and said, you will not take my friends, I will go in their stead. I've never seen a United States president cry until April of 2008. That's when President George W. Bush invited Mansoor's parents into the East Room of the White House to give them their son's Medal of Honor posthumously. The president couldn't even get through the citation without breaking down. Since then, Monsors High School in Garden Grove, California, not far from here, built a new stadium. They named it Michael A. Monsor Memorial Stadium. The golden trident insignia that the SEALs wear dominates the 50-yard line. January 2019, four years ago, just south of here, North Island, California, near San Diego. The United States Navy commissioned the USS Michael Monsor, the newest guided missile destroyer in the fleet, Zumwalt class. I was just in San Diego in August. That ship is sitting in that bay. This is Monsor's mother, Sally, being escorted onto the ship named in honor of her fallen son. Now, why did they do this? Because Michael Monsoor literally sacrificed himself to save his friends. There's no greater love than to sacrifice yourself to save your friends, said Jesus of Nazareth before he went to the cross. Michael Monsoor sacrificed himself to save his friends. The question is, would anyone sacrifice himself to save you? And the answer is, Someone already has. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. But in today's culture, many people don't think this story's true. They think it's invented. After all, it was written down by religious people. We know religious people tend to embellish things. Not only that, it's got miracles in it, like a resurrection. We don't believe in miracles anymore. How many people in this room have ever seen someone rise from the dead after you knew they were dead for at least 36 hours. Yeah, none of us. Yet if you're a Christian, you have to believe something that none of us have ever seen. How rational is that? Well, I actually think it's quite easy to show that Christianity is true. You only need to answer four questions to show that it's true. In other words, if you investigate these four questions... I think you'll realize that the answer to these four questions is yes, and if the answer to these four questions is yes, then Christianity is true. 
What are the four questions? Here are the four questions. is some pretty grooving music, isn't it? <laughs> Actually, that's from our TV show on every Wednesday nights here on the West Coast. It'd be 6 p.m. It's on DirecTV channel 378. How many people here have DirecTV? Can I see your hands, please? DirecTV. Like 12 of us. <laughs> Come on, friends don't let friends watch cable. All right, how many people here have Roku? Roku. All right, good, good. Check out NRB on Roku. If you don't have DirecTV and you don't have Roku, it's on this new technology sweeping California right now. It's called the internet. Have you guys heard of this? Yeah, it's on our website right there, crossexamine.org. We're also on radio every Saturday mornings, but it's also podcasted so you can listen to it anytime you want. It's called the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast. What we do is we present evidence for Christianity and we cross-examine ideas against it. Now, why are these the four questions? Truth, God, miracles, and the New Testament. This is going to serve as our outline here this morning, and tonight at 6 p.m. we'll continue. But the first question, does truth exist? Why is that important? Because you hear people saying, there's no truth, you got your truth, I got my truth, all truth is relative, right? Well, if there is no truth, obviously Christianity can't be true. Of course, if there is no truth, atheism can't be true either, right? Now, of course, there's truth, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, if there was no truth, would you ever go to school? Aren't you going to school to learn truth, right? Would you ever come to church? Would you ever read a book? Would you ever? Of course, there's truth. In fact, if there was no truth, you could never catch anyone in a lie, could you? Right? I mean, lies presuppose truth. Of course, there's truth because we know there are lies. Just turn on the TV. You'll see them everywhere, right? So we'll deal with that question first. Second question, does God exist? Obviously, Christianity can't be true if there's no God. But I hope to show you tonight through three arguments that there really is a theistic God. What's a theistic God? That's a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, moral, personal, intelligent creator who created all things and sustains all things to this very minute. Now, you don't need any kind of Bible or any kind of religious writing to know that this God exists. You can show that God exists without any reference to any religious writing. And tonight, we're going to go through those three arguments. Those arguments are in the Bible, but you don't need the Bible to know them. Third question, are miracles possible? Obviously, Christianity can't be true if miracles are not possible. But I hope to show you tonight that not only are miracles possible, but the greatest miracle in the Bible has already occurred, and even atheists are admitting the evidence for this miracle. Then we're going to get to the key question, is the New Testament true? The New Testament doesn't have a prayer if there is no truth, no God, or no miracles. But if truth exists, if God exists, if miracles are possible, then we're going to see... If the New Testament documents and other evidence surrounding those documents, if that evidence is reliable enough for us to conclude that one particular event from the ancient world took place that would confirm Christianity, what is that event? Anyone? The resurrection. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, game over, Christianity is true. Of course, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, game over, it's false, and you might as well sleep in on Sunday and do what you want the rest of the week, because if Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, your faith is in vain, as the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. Do you realize that Christianity is a religion you can test out and see if it's actually true? It's not just someone's philosophy. It's actually based in history. And you can check it out and see if it's true, and that's what we're going to do. Now, from this point, you can actually show the Bible, the whole Bible's true, and Christianity broadly is true. You say, how? Because if Jesus predicted and accomplished his own resurrection from the dead then he's God. And whatever God teaches is true. Jesus taught the Old Testament as the Word of God, and he promised the New Testament. You say, well, why, why trust Jesus? Look, I just have a personal policy. If somebody predicts and accomplishes his own resurrection from the dead, I just trust whatever the guy says, okay? Now, all the details are in the book, but some of you may be thinking, wait a minute, Frank, uh, why should we even give evidence for Christianity? Aren't we supposed to just have faith blindly? 
No, 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 a thousand times no. In fact, the scriptures themselves tell us you ought to have evidence. Here's just one passage from Peter where he says, always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Now, the gentleness and respect thing is hard for me because I'm originally from New Jersey, all right? But we're supposed to give evidence and reasons why we believe what we believe. So that's what I want to do here this morning and into tonight. Now, what we're going to do this morning is just point one, does truth exist? And then tonight we'll get into uh, does God exist or miracles possible? Is the New Testament true? And then tonight, if I time it just right, we'll have absolutely no time for questions. <laughs> no, no, no. We'll have time for questions tonight. So that's what we're going to do. But we're going to start here at point one, does truth exist? Are you guys ready to go? All right. Now, whenever you start, whenever you start talking about truth, you always have to start with Jack Nicholson. <laughs> right? Because Tom Cruise had him on the witness stand, and he said to him, Colonel, I want the truth. And Nicholson said, <laughs> That was even lamer than the 8 a.m. <laughs> Those people were hardly awake, and neither are you. He didn't say it that way. He didn't say, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> he said it that way. The movie would have gone nowhere. That's not how he said it. Here's how he said I it. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. All right, let's try it again. I want the truth. <laughs> now that felt better, didn't it? <laughs> didn't you always want to do that in church? Pastor John gets up here and you just say, you can't handle the truth. Well, there's a lot of people that can't handle the truth. They're saying, you got your truth, I got my truth, all truth is relative. Well, if you don't get anything else out of what we talk about this morning or even tonight, what we're going to talk about now is the most important thinking skill I've ever learned. And half of what you need to know to defend the Christian faith, you'll already know if you get this thinking skill down. It only takes a few minutes to get it down. Why? Because half of what you need to know is how to identify statements that are false, how to expose them. Because half the battle is avoiding what is false so you can concentrate on what is true. And this thinking skill will help you discover what is false. And it's so easy. Look, I was 33 years old. I already had a master's degree, and I didn't know what I'm about to tell you now to show you what a dimwit I was. You know why? I was Not until I went to seminary did I ever take a course in logic. Has anyone had a course in logic? All right, these same people with their hands up, these are your homeschoolers, okay? <laughs> if we could teach logic in the California public school system, a lot of our problems would evaporate. Because if you could teach te people how to think, then they could figure out for themselves what's true and what isn't. So this thinking skill, the easiest way for me to show it to you is to give you and a, an example of using this thinking skill. Suppose someone were to come up to you and say, there is no truth. You should ask that person a question. What should the question be? This is the interactive portion of the program. Come on. <laughs> yeah, somebody says there's no truth. You're going to say, hey, is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? Because if it's true that there's no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true, but it claims to be true. Did I say that right? Can everybody see that this is a self-defeating statement? What's a self-defeating statement? A self-defeating statement doesn't meet its own standard. A self-defeating statement violates the law of non-contradiction, which says that opposite ideas cannot both be true at the same time and in the same sense. For example, God can't exist and not exist at the same time and in the same sense, right? Either does exist or he doesn't, right? We, either, we are either in California or we're not in California. They both can't be true at the same time and in the same sense. Either truth exists or it doesn't exist. It's one or the other. But to say there's no truth is actually a truth claim. I mean, if I were to say I can't speak a word in English, what would you say? Yeah, you're using it right now. Can you see this is a self-defeating statement? Or it would be like if I said, my parents had no kids that lived. <laughs> or my brother is an only child. <laughs> or everything I say is a lie. Some of you will get that tomorrow. <laughs> or all generalizations are false. Some of you will never get that one, all right? 
These are known as self-defeating statements. Now, here's the thinking skill. Here's what you need to do. When someone says something, you want to turn the claim on itself. Turn the claim on itself. So someone says there's no truth, you turn the claim on itself, and you simply ask, is that true? All right, so let's do a few more of these, because these statements are everywhere in our culture. Sometimes it's said this way, there's no such thing as absolute truth. If someone says there's no such thing as absolute truth, if you turn the claim on itself, what question are you going to ask back? Yes, is that an absolute truth? Or you might say, are you absolutely sure? Right? There are no absolute truths. Can everyone see that this statement right here is an absolute truth claim claiming there are no such thing as absolute truths? It's self-defeating. It's like saying, I can't speak a word in English. Now, in our culture, it's normally said this way now. There isn't the truth, only my truth. You know, you've got your truth, I've got my truth, you live your truth, I'll live my truth, we'll all get along. It sounds so reasonable, right? It sounds so Oprah, right? That we, we all ought to agree with this, right? There's just one big problem with it. It's self-defeating. Because if you turn the claim on itself, if someone says there isn't the truth, only my truth, you simply want to ask them, is that just your truth or the truth? Because if this statement up here is just your truth, in other words, it's just your personal opinion, then why should I believe it? It's just an opinion. It's not really true. But if you're saying the statement up there is the truth, well, the first half of the statement says there are no the truths. Can everyone see that this is a the truth statement claiming there are no the truths? Again, it's like saying I can't speak a word in English. Now, I know this is unpopular in our culture today, but I'm going to say it anyway. There's no such thing as your truth. There's no such thing as my truth. There's just the truth. I mean, if you're going to say you have your own truth, you might as well say, look, I have my own math. I mean, suppose Pastor John were to ask me to come over his house and do a little yard work. Frank, I need some extra help. Come over to my house. I'll pay you $10 an hour. Now, Pastor John would never do this because he doesn't pay that much. All right, but... <laughs> But let's say I went over to his house. He said, just work as many hours, I'll pay you. So I, I work 15 hours over at his house. And I go, John, I'm done. Uh, you owe me uh, $150,000. $150,000? He says, I don't owe you $150,000. I owe you one hundred fifty. dollars I go, oh, no, no, you don't understand. I have my own math. <laughs> what do you think he's going to say? You're crazy. There's no such thing as your math or my math. There's just math. There's no such thing as your truth or my truth. There's just truth. So we've got to get used to this because, unfortunately, people are saying self-defeating things and they're being deceived by it. As if you can create your own reality. You can't create your own reality. Oh, you can try, but you're going to smack up against reality and eventually it's going to hurt. If you love people, you will tell them the truth. That there is only the truth... Not your truth, not my truth, just the truth. Now, sometimes it isn't said this way, sometimes it's said this way. It's true for you, but not for me. Well, Christianity may be true for you, but Buddhism's true for me. What's the problem with that? This is also self-defeating, it's just a little bit more subtle. If somebody says it's true for you, but not for me, if you turn the claim on itself, what you want to ask them, is that true for everybody? Is true for you, but not for me, true for everybody? Because if true for you, but not for me, is true for everybody, then true for you, but not for me, can't be true, because it's true for everybody. Did I say that right? I know that can give you intellectual constipation if you think about it long enough. But that's because it's self-defeating. It violates the law of non-contradiction. Actually, there's a more fun way of dealing with this. If somebody says it's true for you, but not for me, say, sure, go try that with your bank teller. Yeah, go to your bank teller and say, uh, look, the economy's down, inflation's up, I need some extra money, I'd like $100,000 out of my account. The bank teller looks at your account and says, I'm sorry, I only have $4.16 in your account. It's easy to get the money, you simply say, that's true for you, but not for me. Give me the hundred grand. Are you going to get the money? No, if there was only $4.12 in your account, that's true for all people at all times in all places when referring to your account at that time. It's just true. It's not just your truth or my truth. It's just true. Or let's say you're going a little fast down Highway 15 out here. You're going 100 miles an hour. California straight State Patrolman pulls you over, walks up to your car, knocks on the glass. You put the window down. He says, you're going 100. 
It's easy to get out of a ticket. You simply look back up at him and you go, that's true for you, but not for me. And you speed away. (laughs) He can't give you a ticket if it's not true for you, can he? Look, if you were really going 100, that's true for all people at all times, in all places, we're referring to you at that time. It's just true. It's not your truth or his truth. It's just true. And by the way, if it's really true that God exists and Jesus rose from the dead, then Christianity is true, regardless of whether you believe it or not. You know what, you know what, what is also true? If, if God doesn't exist or Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then Christianity is false. It doesn't matter what you believe about it. It's false. I go to a lot of churches. I normally ask people, do you think Christianity is true? Most people will say yes. And then I'll ask them why. Do you know what answer I get more than any other? Because I have faith. Is that a good answer? Does your faith change whether or not God exists or Jesus rose from the dead? No, either God exists and Jesus rose from the dead or not, regardless of what you believe about it. I mean, do you have to believe something to make it true? Do you have to believe in gravity to stay on the ground? Do people who don't believe in gravity float away? (laughs) Hey, look, there's another one. (laughs) Hey, if you believe, you'll come back. No, that's not the way it works. You say, why is the Bible always talking about faith then? Because there's two kinds of faith. This is a very important distinction. There's belief that, and then there's belief in. Belief that is getting evidence that God exists, that Jesus rose from the dead, that the scriptures are telling us the truth. But all the belief that in the world won't get your moral transgressions forgiven. For that, you got to go from belief that to belief in, to trust in. You see, there's a difference between intellectually knowing something's true and trusting in it. James, the half-brother of Jesus, who wrote that little book in the New Testament called, you guys are sharp this morning. James says, even the demons believe that God exists, but they tremble. Do you realize that if God exists, and he does, and demons exist, and they do, that demons know that God exists better than we do? But they don't trust in him. Why, they don't want to trust in him. They want to go their own way. Because there's a difference between belief that and belief in. We know this in relationships, don't we? When I met my wife 37 years ago, I got evidence that she would be a good wife, but all the evidence in the world didn't make her my wife. I had to take a step of trust in her to ask her to be my wife. And in a momentary lapse of judgment, she said yes. (laughs) That's the difference between belief that and belief in. You can know something's true, but still not assent to it. And some ladies in here, suppose you're dating somebody that you really like this guy and you want to turn to marriage. Suppose he were to come up to you and say, you know, I think, you, I think that you would make a good wife. What are you going to do at that point? Yeah. Is that it? You think that I would make a good I mean, is that enough? Has he gone far enough? No, he's got to go from belief that to belief in. There's a difference. Now, most of the time when the Bible's talking about faith, it's talking about the second kind. Belief that or trust in. It's talking about trust in. Belief that is just of the head. Belief in is also of the heart. After you know that it's true, will you trust in Jesus to forgive you of your sins and so he can give you his righteousness? But if you don't want to do that, that's up to you. A number of years ago, I was uh, debating an atheist at the University of Michigan. His name is Eddie Tabash. He, He lives in Beverly Hills. And during the debate, He asked me a question, and the question went this way. Frank, my mother was a survivor of the Holocaust. She lived a life full of pain and suffering. Toward the end of her life, someone offered her the gospel, but she rejected it, and then she died. Is she in hell right now? Tough question to ask in front of a secular audience. So I said, Eddie, I don't know where your mother is right now. I don't know if she had a deathbed conversion or not, but if she didn't accept Christ before she died, then God is too loving to force her into heaven against her will. You see, because the assumption is everybody wants to go to heaven, that 
is not true. Who's in heaven? Jesus is in heaven. There have been people running from Jesus their entire lives. What's he going to do in the afterlife? Going, hey, where are you going? Get over here. <laughs> that wouldn't be loving. You say, what's all this business about hell? Well, I use this illustration with the University of Michigan audience. I'll use it with you now. This is a question for the ladies. Ladies, this question is just for you. Ladies, have you ever had a young man pursue you whom you did not want to date? Some of you are going, yeah, and he's sitting next to me right now. <laughs> he will not leave me alone. <laughs> Whenever I ask that question, the ladies always giggle and the men look at their shoes. Like, <laughs> is she looking at me right now? Well, ladies, suppose this man keeps asking you out, keeps asking you out, and he, you finally say to him, now look, I like you, but only as a... Ladies, why don't you just stick the knife in and turn it? <laughs> Every man has heard the dreaded friend rejection. Gentlemen, if you ever get the, fr the dreaded friend rejection, move on. She's not interested. In fact, I have some shocking news for you. She doesn't even like you as a friend. <laughs> Ladies, am I right? Come on, yeah, you're just trying to be nice. Because if you really did like them, you'd be interested, but you don't, okay? Well, suppose this doesn't deter the guy. Suppose he keeps coming, he keeps coming, he, keeps, he says, look, I love you so much, I'm going to force you to love me. Ladies, run, screaming from the building. Can he force you to love him? No, love by definition must be freely given. So if he truly did love you, if he truly wanted what was best for you, what would he do? He would leave you alone. That's what God does for us. He sends us cards, letters, and flowers. He sends us creation. He sends us conscience. He sends us Christ. He sends us the Bible. He sends us Pastor John. If you're off in a foreign land somewhere, a Muslim somewhere, and you want to know the truth, but the gospel's not getting through, he may send you a dream or a vision. So you know the truth. But if God does all that and you keep saying, no, 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 I don't want you, I want to go my own way, God will give you up to your own desire. Okay, Paul actually says this in Romans chapter 1. If you suppress the truth long enough, he's going to ultimately give you up because that's what love does. He lets you go. You say, well, what could be so bad about that? To be let alone. Well, think about it this way. Everybody, regardless of whether you're a Christian or not, gets some of the common grace of God. Everyone experiences, to a certain extent, love, relationships, uh, a future, a hope for a future. His, rain, his rain falls on the just and the unjust. But I want you to imagine a place where there is no love, where there are no relationships, where there is no future, where there is no hope. There's just stone cold, narcissistic self-absorption. That is Washington. No. <laughs> 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 and Sacramento. No. <laughs> that is hell. You're separated from the ultimate source of goodness by your own choice. As C.S. Lewis famously said, in the end, there's only two kinds of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, thy will be done. Look, if you don't want them now, you're not going to want them in eternity. So there's a difference between belief that and belief in. Faith is not blind. Faith is trusting in what you have good evidence to believe. Trusting in what you have good evidence to believe, to go from belief that to belief in. All we're doing today, ladies and gentlemen, is we're just talking about belief that. There is no evidence that can make you go from belief that to belief in. That's up to you yielding to the Holy Spirit. Are you going to do that? Are you going to keep saying, no, 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 I want to go my own way? It's up to you. You have the free will to do that. How about this? There's no truth in anything but science. Probably heard this. What's the problem with the claim? Turn the claim on itself. Someone says there's no truth in anything but science. The question you want to ask is, is that a scientific truth? Can you go in the laboratory and prove that claim? No, that's not a scientific truth. That's not even a claim from science, that's a claim about science. In fact, we have a book out there called Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case. 
And in the chapter on science, here's the title of the chapter. Science doesn't say anything. Scientists do. You ever notice that science doesn't say a word? And why do I say that? Because all data needs to be gathered, and all data needs to be interpreted. And who does that? Science doesn't do that. Scientists do that. You ever wonder why you get conflicting advice on COVID? You say, well, follow the science. Which science? You've got to follow scientists, right? Look, if scientists have good data and they interpret it properly, you'll get good advice. If they have good data, they don't interpret it properly, you get bad advice. You've got bad data, it doesn't matter how they interpret it, you're not going to get good advice. If there's a political agenda, oh, no, that'll never happen. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, why do we think that scientists are somehow immune to the three great temptations the rest of us all have? In fact, we're going to talk about these three great temptations tonight. Scientists are just as flawed as anybody else. And if they have an agenda that causes them to interpret the data the way they want rather than the way it really is, you're going to get bad advice. Because science doesn't say a word. And by the way, you can't do science without philosophy. Science is built on philosophy. So is reading the Bible. You might not think that. You couldn't even understand what the Bible says unless you knew how to think, and that's what philosophy is part. Part of philosophy is learning how to think. And if you think about this, the most important aspects of life have nothing to do with science. Honey, do you love me? Yeah. Why? I don't know. Let's run an experiment. No! We'll talk more about that tonight. In fact, some of the evidence for God is scientific in nature. How about this? You hear this a lot. You should doubt everything. This is what the skeptics say. What's the problem with the claim? Turn the claim on itself. Somebody says you ought to doubt everything. What should you say? Yeah, should I doubt that? Why are skeptics skeptical of everything but skepticism? Notice they don't doubt that. They think it's true. Now, how many people in here regardless of what you think about God, how many people in here sometimes doubt that what you think about God is true? Look, if you don't have your hand up right now, you're probably not thinking very much. Look, <laughs> I've written books on this stuff, and sometimes I wake up in the morning, I go, I don't even know if this is true. You ever do that? But then I start thinking about my doubts, and I realize most of my doubts are emotional. They're not intellectual. In other words, the evidence for Christianity is really good. If I'm having a good day, everything's fine. Bad day, don't know. Good day, fine. Bad day, don't know. Good day, fine. Bad day, don't know. Who's changing? Me or the evidence? I'm changing. I'm going up and down. In fact, my friend Greg Kokel, you may know him. He wrote the great book, Tactics. If you don't have the book, Tactics, you ought to get it. It helps you converse with people on these issues. And here's what Greg says. He says, before I have my first cup of coffee in the morning... I'm an atheist. <laughs> After I have my first cup, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> By the time I have my second cup, I'm back to being a Christian. Now, what's changing, him or the evidence? He's going up and down. The evidence doesn't change. You know, sometimes when we go to college campuses, I'll meet former Christians who are now atheists, and they'll say to me, Frank, I used to be a Christian, but I lost my faith. Do you know what I want? You know what I want to say to him? So? So? Are you saying because your psychology changed that somehow God has popped out of existence? Because, if you're, because your psychology has changed, that Jesus hasn't risen from the dead? Do you realize that your psychology is not going to tell you what's true outside your skull? The evidence will. Don't let your psychology overpower the evidence. In fact, you might, your psychology can change with the weather. Your psychology can change because of the bad pizza you had last night, right? It goes up and down. You've got to concentrate on the evidence to figure out what really is true and what isn't. In fact, to come here yesterday, I had to, I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. I had to take a couple flights to get here. And when I got on the plane, I'd only, I not only believed that the plane would get there, I trusted in the pilots, ATC, the maintenance crew to get me there, right? But do you realize there are some people that cannot get on an airplane? Psychologically, it freaks them out. They think, I'm going to die if I go on an airplane. But you know what the evidence says? 
The evidence says the safest way to get anywhere is on an airplane. You should be more afraid of getting in your car than getting on an airplane. But we allow our psychology to psych us out of the evidence. The truth is, air travel is very safe, safer than ground travel. But we still get in cars, don't we? Same thing is true about Christianity. The evidence for Christianity is really good. But sometimes we allow our psychology to overpower that. Now, if you realize, if you concentrate on the evidence, you're going to realize that Christianity is true. Then you can start doubting your doubts. And if you start doubting your doubts, then you're back to knowing something for sure. Have you guys ever thought about doubting your doubts? I doubt it. <laughs> this is probably the biggest one in our culture. You ought not judge. And if you're a Christian, people are going to say, Jesus said don't judge. Why are you judging, you hypocrite? All right, let's just save Jesus for just a second. Logically, what's the problem with this claim? Turn the claim on itself. Somebody says you ought not judge, what are you going to say? Yeah, you're going to say, hey, isn't that a judgment? Well, you might want to put your hands on your hips and say, if we're not to judge, then why are you judging me for judging? <laughs> See, because it's a judgment. You say, wait a minute, Frank, didn't Jesus say don't judge? Nope, never said it. Oh, come on, he did. He said it in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. It's right in the middle of the, of the Sermon on the Mount, his most famous sermon. All right, I know it's going to sound weird for just a minute, but it's true. There are no verses in the Bible. There are no verses in the Bible. Do you think when, when Matthew was writing his biography of Jesus, which we call a gospel, that he said, here's chapter 7, verse 1? No. When were the chapter and verse divisions added to the Bible text? About 500 years ago to help us navigate the text, which is really important. Why? Because it's a really long series of books. It'd be really hard to find your way around if you didn't have numbers in there. I mean, imagine if um, Pastor John got up here one Sunday. You didn't have numbers in your Bible. He didn't have numbers in his. And he just said, let's go about two-thirds of the way in. Let's see if we can find the same spot. Right? No. <laughs> You wouldn't be able to do that. So we need numbers. The problem is we tend to think if it's got a number in front of it, we can just take it out and make it say whatever we want. Now, some of you are going to hate me for this, but I don't care. I'm leaving tomorrow. All right? <laughs> but this is why you shouldn't take Jeremiah 29.11 as a promise to you. You know Jeremiah 29, oh, the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you. I mean, this stuff is in pillows. This stuff is on in wall hangings, it's in birthday cards. I mean, it's everywhere, right? It's not a promise to 21st century Christians. The context of the text is that was a promise to the exiles that went to Babylon in 586 BC. God said in 70 years he would prosper them, bring them back to the land. It was a promise to them, not a promise to us. So unless you're 2,600 years old living under Nebuchadnezzar, this was never a promise to you. All right. When people quote that, I go, why, why, why are you quoting Jeremiah 29, 11 and not Jeremiah 44, 11? Why? What does Jeremiah 44, 11 say? Jeremiah 44, 11 is what God told, what he promised to the people that went to Egypt. And God said, don't go to Egypt in the exile. Don't go there. You know what Jeremiah 44, 11 says? It says, I will destroy you and all Judah. You don't see that stitched into a pillow. <laughs> You don't see that on a birthday card. Happy birthday. I will destroy you in all Judah. Well, that's so sweet. Thank you, Grandma. No. Because we're taking it out of context. The same thing is true with Matthew chapter 7, 1. Does Jesus say, judge not? And does he stop right there? No, what does he say? He says, judge not, lest you be judged. By the same standard you judge others, you be judged by that standard. So before you try and take the speck out of your brother's eye, take the log out of your own eye first, then you'll be better able to help your brother. Is Jesus telling us not to judge here? No, he's telling us to take the speck out of our brother's eye. That involves making a judgment. He also calls him a hypocrite. Notice that? That's a judgment as well. So this is not a command not to judge. It's actually a command on how to judge. If you've got that problem, fix it, then go help your brother. But it would be completely ridiculous to say don't make judgments. Why? Because number one, it's a judgment itself. And number two, 
you'd be dead already if you didn't make judgments. You made a hundred judgments this morning just getting over here. Good choices from bad choices, safe choices from dangerous choices. Now you're going, this was a bad judgment. This guy's crazy. What, why am I even here? Everybody's making judgments. Atheists make judgments. They judge there's no God. They judge Jesus didn't rise from the dead. They judge there is no objective meaning to life. You're just going to die one day and it's going to be over. You're just going to become worm food. There's no hope. Have a nice day. These are all judgments. The question isn't whether or not you can make judgments. The question is, are your judgments true? This is why Jesus said in John uh, chapter 7, verse 24, he said, stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. You have to make judgments. I will say this, though. Jesus did save a very stern rebuke for people who were judgmental. And who were the judgmental ones in his day? The Pharisees. And who were the Pharisees? The Pharisees were the religious and political leaders of Israel. They were on the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, to whom Rome delegated much of the day-to-day -day lawmaking authority. They were the politicians of Israel. And Jesus went after these people. Are you telling me Jesus got involved in politics? Yes! And he wasn't so nice doing it. In fact, if you think Jesus was a sweet guy who's never said a bad word about anyone, you have not read John chapter 2, John chapter 8, or Matthew chapter 23. What happens in John chapter 2? Jesus makes a whip and he goes and he jacks people up in the temple. What sweet and gentle Jesus did this? Yes. And then in John chapter 8, he's arguing with these politician Pharisee people. He's right in the middle of an argument with him, and he says, your father is the devil. Jesus, you can't say that. That's not very Christ-like. Excuse me, I am Christ. <laughs> you imagine you have an argument with somebody, you stop right in the middle and you go, your father is the devil. Never try that with a sibling, by the way. <laughs> and then in Matthew 23, Jesus goes after these people again, these politicians. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Oh, you look great on the outside. You're whitewashed tombs, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. You go a mile to make a convert, then once you make them a convert, you make them twice as much a son of hell as you are. How will you avoid being condemned to hell? What? Sweet and gentle Jesus said this? Yes. Jesus was not Barney. Can't we all get along, boys and girls? He was not Mr. Rogers. Can you say kindness, boys and girls? I mean, Jesus was kind most of the time, but he certainly didn't go around saying, this sermon brought to you by the letter E. <laughs> no, Jesus was tough. In fact, why did they kill him? Number one, because he claimed to be God, which was blasphemy to the Jews and sedition to the Romans. And number two, he spoke truth to power, particularly the temple authorities who wanted him dead because if he succeeded, they were out of business. In fact, I think Caiaphas, the high priest, knew Jesus was the Messiah. He knew Jesus had resurrected Lazarus from the dead. What does he say, as recorded in John chapter 12, about this? It's better that one innocent man die than the whole nation perish. Caiaphas killed him so he could maintain his power. By the way, I've noticed one other thing about judging do you ever notice when you compliment somebody, which is a judgment, nobody gets upset? You know, if you say to your best friend, I really love you. You're such a wonderful person. I wish I could be like you. You think your friend's going to say, well, who are you to judge? <laughs> right? like, nobody's going to say that, right? See, I've noticed that people don't have a problem with judging. They just have a problem with judgments they don't like. In fact, if you tell somebody something that's true and they get mad at you, you just helped convict them. As Augustine said, we love the truth when it enlightens us. We hate the truth when it convicts us. A few military people in here. By the way, I was in the Navy for eight, year, eight years, which stands for never again volunteer yourself. <laughs> A few military people in here, you always get more flack when you're over the target. If you tell somebody something that's true and they're shooting back at you, you're over the target. They don't want their evil deeds exposed. You're shining light where they don't want light shined. Jesus said, men love darkness rather than light. 
So we're to make judgments without being judgmental. One person put it this way, evangelism is just one beggar showing another beggar where the food is. None of us are getting anywhere without Jesus. We need Him. Now we could spend a lot more time, but we don't have it on these self-defeating statements. I want to sum it up this way. Can everybody see that this statement right here shoots itself? Can everybody see that? And all the other statements we went through, there are no absolutes, it's true for you but not for me, there isn't the truth, only my truth, all truth comes from science, you ought to doubt all things, you ought not judge, they're all self-defeating. So you got to get good at turning the claim on itself. Don't believe false statements and false philosophies about life. It's going to lead you astray. So there is truth out there. Now, I did mention that we go to college campuses and present this. We've got about 10 colleges scheduled this semester. This actually happens to be a picture from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And they love the Bible there about as much as the University of California at Berserkly does. <laughs> and so when an atheist gets up to the microphone, if the atheist expresses any hostility at all, I'll normally ask this question, and I recommend you ask a question like this as well. When they get up to the microphone, I'll normally ask them, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? I've had atheists stand at that microphone in front of hundreds of people and say, no! No. I thought you claimed to be reasonable. How is it reasonable? You wouldn't believe something if it were true. It's not. It's not reasonable. The problem isn't in the head. The problem's in the heart. They don't want it to be true. They don't want there to be a God. Why? Because they want to be God of their own lives. They're not on a truth quest. They're on a happiness quest. And they're just going to believe whatever they think is going to make them happy. Here's the problem. You can make yourself happy over the short term, doing a lot of fun, selfish, but sinful things. Yet over the long term, it's a disaster. And everyone in this room over 40 knows what I'm talking about because many of us have tried it ourselves. If you want to get contentment, you've got to go straight through truth. And Jesus is the truth. But many people don't want to do that. They want to do it their own way. They don't want to yield to him. In fact, let me ask you guys a question in here. Informal survey. This is just for Christians. If you're not a Christian here, thank you for being here, but this question isn't for you. This is just for the Christians. Christians, I want you to think of someone you know who's not a Christian whom you'd like to be a Christian. You got someone? All right, don't point at them. All right. All right. Is the person you're thinking of on a relentless pursuit of truth, they want to know if Christianity is true, or are they apathetic, maybe even hostile to Christianity? How many people say the person I'm thinking of right now is on a relentless pursuit of truth? They want to know if Christianity is true. Crickets. How many people say the person I'm thinking of is apathetic or hostile? Yeah, look around the room. It's either... 99 to 1 or 100 to 0. You see, most people are looking for God like a criminal is looking for a cop. <laughs> They're running. They don't want it to be true. So ask them the question, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? If the person hesitates or says no, the problem's not in the head, the problem's in the heart. What do you do for such a person? Person, You pray for them. You love them, which as we'll see tonight, doesn't mean you approve of everything they do. You plant seeds, and then you wait. Because disaster is going to strike at some point, because we live in a fallen world, all of us are going to go through pain and suffering. If the person ever becomes open, it's going to be when that happens. Then your phone's going to ring, and that person's going to be on the other end. They're not going to call their atheist friend when things go bad. What's the atheist going to say? There's no rhyme or reason to any of this. There's no meaning to life. Stuff happens. No, they're going to call you a person of spiritual depth. When the student's ready, the teacher will appear. So just plant seeds, pray, love them, and wait. But ask the question. Now, I know a lot of people don't want Christianity to be true because they've been hurt by Christians. Yeah, I get that. But let me ask you a question. When somebody plays Beethoven poorly, who do you blame? You don't blame Beethoven. 
When somebody plays Jesus poorly, you don't blame Jesus. We're all fallen. Don't expect the Christian to be perfect. Expect the Christian to mess up. But that doesn't mean Christianity's false because Christians don't always act like Jesus. Newsflash, Christianity is not Christians. Christianity is Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. In fact, you may want to modify the question I just gave you. If Christianity is a problem to them, then just ask them this question. If Jesus predicted and accomplished His own resurrection from the dead to prove He was God, would you follow Him? Again, if the answer is no, the problem's not in the head, the problem's in the heart. They want to be God. They want to do their own thing. So, it is true that truth exists. The next question, is it true that God exists? And that's what we're going to do tonight. And the next two questions after that, are miracles possible? Is the New Testament true? Now, if you can't come back tonight, or even if you can, you may want to go much deeper. And to do that, I want you to text the word evidence to 855-909-0582. Text the word evidence to 855-909-0582. I'm going to send you the entire PowerPoint presentation in a PDF format to your email. Just text that there. I'll send you a bunch of other stuff for free too. In fact, I've showed you maybe 25 slides this morning. I'm going to send you the entire 360 slide PowerPoint presentation. You can look at it anytime you want. Now, we do have the books and DVD sets available on the book table. I want to point out that all the proceeds of the sale of the books and the DVDs will go to feed needy children. Mine. Okay? <laughs> Just so you know. Got some sun, so I need some help. All right? Anyway, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist is out there. So is a 12-part DVD series that a lot of people use in small groups or Sunday schools or home schools. Uh, you can get that out there. You can actually get some workbooks that go along with that from our website. My son and I just wrote a brand new book called Hollywood Heroes, How Your Favorite Movies Reveal God. We take some of what I said here today and what I'll say tonight, and we put it in the context of movies. Do you realize that most of the major blockbuster movies of the past four decades all steal from the greatest story ever told? The story of Jesus. So that's what that book is about. There's also the book Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case out there. So if you want to go further, get those books. I'll be at the book table as well. And tonight, when you come back, we're going to see that there's a lot more related to, doc, uh, related to the U.S. Navy SEAL Michael Monsor. And we'll also see that someone actually did die for you and didn't just die, but he also rose again. And he's going to raise us from the, day, from the dead sometime in the future. Father, I